Welcome to Friday Night with Byline Times with me, Hardeep Matharu. And with me, Peter Chooks. And for the next hour, we'll be bringing you what the papers don't say. And what the TV doesn't always want to tell you. Coming up tonight, we have a packed show going behind the scenes of the chaos at the conference. What did this year's Tory party get-together reveal about the state of Liz Truss's administration and the extreme turn that the party seems to be taking? Well, to dissect all of this, we will be joined by the Conservative London Assembly member, Emma Best, and the City AM columnist, Elliot Wilson, before being joined by the former Conservative MP and Attorney General, Dominic Grieve. Now, you might have heard in the last 24 hours of a world exclusive by our sister site, Byline Investigates, which has revealed that the Daily Mail is being sued for things much worse than phone hacking, i.e. allegations of burglary and phone tapping, landline tapping. The claimants include Prince Harry, Elton John and Baroness Doreen Lawrence. Well, what is going on here? We'll be hearing from the chair of Byline Investigates and a Byline Times writer, Brian Cathcart, and be discussing the state of the press with Otto English and Jonathan Lisk and asking ourselves, can we really look forward to Lord Paul Dacre? But we couldn't do any of this without you. Byline TV is your independent TV channel. So if you do like what we do, whether that's our live shows, Friday Night with Byline Times and The Table, or our long form documentaries like John Sweeney's Compromat, or going behind the scenes with our producers, then just head over to byline.tv forward slash join and become a member and join our community today. Yes, as a member, there are many benefits that we've always tried to explain. And we'll have some more news of exclusive documentary only available by Byline to Byline TV members. Two new documentaries coming up this year. And tonight is particularly relevant because if you sign up and there is a discount code, it's only £2 for the first month if you use the discount code Friday. What do you get tonight, Hardy? Well, you get to join us for our After Dark Q&A, which takes place every week after this live show ends. Tonight, we're going to have Otto English, Jonathan List and Elliot Wilson on the blue sofa. So if you can sign up now, byline.tv forward slash join, put your questions to our guests. And it's going to be a lot of fun with those three on the sofa, if we can fit them. And it's a private conversation, so you can ask things you can't in public. And of course, as I said, don't forget that discount code, Friday, and that makes it only £2 for the first month. Now, we're working on the print edition, Hardy, yes. which we'll reveal next week, a monthly print edition of Byline Times. But here's our digital weekend front page. Great headline by Hardeep on this occasion, Growing Nowhere. I think we get the pun, Hardeep, and it's, it's mainly about, well, quite obviously, what is it about? Yes, Liz Truss's conference speech, and she talked about the anti-growth coalitions, apparently standing in the way of her policies uh, regenerating Britain. And our political ed editor, Adam Bienkoff, who's at the conference, dissects her speech and talks about how the Conservative Party's policies themselves over the last decade have shown uh, that the party has not always been on the side of growth. We also have another article uh, on our digital front page looking at hedge funds and their prominence in British politics. Now, three years ago, Byline Times uh, raised the issue of hedge funds, financiers, many of whom sponsor, uh, fund the Conservative Party and potential political uh, decisions and how they might benefit from them. And it's come to prominence again in recent weeks with the revelation that the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, enjoyed a cocktail party with some of the financiers just hours after delivering his mini budget. Now, a number of those financiers were set to make money from the pound slumping. So, Really, we're asking, why were Byline Times warnings from three years ago ignored? As I always say, read Byline Times to read next year's headlines today. Um, so, the Conservative Party conference. In a moment, we'll be joined by Emma Best, London Assembly City member and the City AM uh, commentator and writer, Elliot Wilson. But first, we'll be hearing from Femi Olawuli, who tried to track down and have a confrontation with Michael Gove, and he spoke to our reporter who was at the conference this week, Caelan Robertson. How has Brexit helped working class people? Uh, well, the 
people of the United Kingdom voted for us to leave how's the European it Union. How's it, how's it and democracy has been upheld. Nice to see. You. That has made things more expensive. Are you happy with what you've done to working class people? Well, uh, both Conservative and Labour parties are now committed to making Brexit work, and I think that's a good thing. Has it damaged our economy, yes or no? Has Brexit damaged our economy at all? <laughs> yes or no? I think, I think uh, as I say, now that we have a, a political consensus that Labour and Conservative MPs committed to making Brexit work, I think that's a great thing. You have, that doesn't answer my question. Yes or no, has Brexit damaged our economy? I think... Uh, you're, okay, the fact, simple fact is, your economists are the Office of Budget Responsibility. You don't have a greater expertise than them. The people you rely on to make your decisions have told you that it's damaged our economy to the tune of £100 billion a year rel relative to where we would have been had we not left the EU. So again, I ask you, has Brexit damaged the economy? Uh, all I would say is that you've clearly got very strong, passionately expressed views of this matter. I'm simply I'm regurgitating your own uh, experts that get it's back to you. So I came here because um, the Conservative Party is obviously in disarray. They have royally screwed up the econ uh, economy and given that the choices are Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, it's, you've got 200,000 deaths under Boris Johnson, a Brexit that's done more damage to our economy than Covid, widespread criminality in the heart of Downing Street on one side or currency collapse, investigations by the IMF and open class warfare on the other, the Tories kind of running out of road. So the mood that I've really sensed is the enough, well, the People's Assembly protest that I was at at one o'clock where people are furious because this was, a, this was a party that promised to be a party of the working class, promised to level people up, and all they've done is the exact opposite. You had Liz Truss on the airwaves a few weeks ago saying that it's fair to give rich people more money. You had um, Rishi Sunak saying he deliberately tried to take money away from poor urban areas. You've got a budget that just came out last Friday, which not only sent the economy into, into a nosedive, but also explicitly said they were going to give for example, £55,000 extra in tax cuts to millionaires whilst only giving £167 to those who are basically on, on minimum wage. It is an utterly elitist uh, policy. And now we're joined in the studio by Emma Best and Elliot Wilson. Thank you both for being here tonight. Elliot, let's start with you. You were at the Conservative Party conference. Was. What was the mood that you picked up on? Uh, the mood was was very fractious. I think it, it's fair to say there was a, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, careful looking over the shoulder and looking at the sort of media reaction, and um, and and a sort of a sense of not quite knowing what everyone else was feeling. Um, it, it wasn't particularly uh, confident or, or happy gathering, I don't think. But then party conferences are odd things. Um, I, I think by definition they're, they're strange beasts. But yeah, I think there was, there was a lot of uncertainty and, and a degree of um, disillusionment perhaps, uh, feeling that things are, are not going as, as well as they might. And did that mainly stem from the economic policies uh, and the consequences that we've seen? Or was there a wider feeling that the party's just going in... No, I, I think it's a weird it's, direction. It's not even just the, the the fiscal statement that the Chancellor put out a couple of weeks ago now. I think it was the fact that that had been so badly received, not only by the markets, but by the media as well. Um, and also that then there had been this, this rowing back, which I think was on the Monday, that the, the 45p tax rate would be kept in place. So I think there was a sense that not only did the membership think that things perhaps weren't going brilliantly, but that clearly the leadership knew that as well. Mm. And I think if you can't demonstrate to your members that you at least are confident about what's happening, then inevitably there's a, a sort of filter, um, a trickle down, if you want, of, um, uh, of, of uncertainty, of, of, of trepidation. I mean, we saw photos of empty bars, Conservative Party members or people attending the conference appearing to be asleep, I mean, what's the tone usually like at, at a Tory party conference? I think in fairness, some of the, the, the emptiness or the, the lack of numbers was due to the, the rail strikes because there was mm. a rail strike on um, Saturday before the conference began and then there was one on Wednesday when it finished. So I think some people who might have been in two minds about going probably didn't. I think certainly on the Wednesday numbers were down because people had left on the Tuesday night so that they avoided the train strikes. Um, Certainly the bars were, were quite busy early on in the week when I saw them. Um, maybe not to a, a manic level, but certainly enough to be deeply uncomfortable if you were going in at the end of a long day. Um, 
So I, I think there's, you know, the membership still wants to to have this gathering every uh, every year and, and see, sort of take the temperature. But it, it was a difficult set of circumstances to have the conference in, there's no question. Emma, what did you make of Liz Truss's speech? Growth, growth, growth. It's a mantra. Is there anything yeah. of substance behind that, would you say? Well, I certainly think there was, but I think actually she did have to give the speech of her life to stay any what mm. in a place of, you know, respect both within the country and within the party. And to be fair, she isn't going to be the great orator that, despite his fault, Boris Johnson was. But she did deliver somewhat, you know, what may have been the speech of her life. Now, that is never going to be the speech, the greatest speech seen in British politics. Mm. But it did deliver some confidence, I think, to the party. But just to touch on that mood, I think it's very important to recognise that going into a conference... 33 points behind in the polls, to be jubilant would be almost, well, it would be disrespectful to the British public. Mm. So I think there, it was right that people were talking and were discussing seriously policies and the direction of our party. And now, I think that, that, was, that, that was a very accurate summary, Elliot, but I would say on the bars, the bars were certainly packed. I mean, if you wanted a drink, you were going to struggle. And I know some pictures went out on the final night. On the final night... Um, in the conference hotel, most people have gone off to the different kind of friends of parties and so it is traditionally more quiet in the conference centre and, and more busy outside. So I, I, it definitely felt as busy, um, mm. and, but I think that it was definitely right that there was no jubilant tone and that people were reflecting on the party and especially the last couple of weeks and the summer. Mm. Emma, how long have you been going to Conservative Conference uh, without asking? Uh, years? You mean this is your well, fourth? I'm fifth. terribly young, so not so, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Not no, not decade. no, um, no I've, I've been for the last five years consecutively. So, you know, it's three years ago that certain members lost the whip, including Dominic Grieve, who'll be joining us later. Mm. Has the character and the makeup of the party changed as well? I mean, I do notice that in the voting statistics, mm. there's a plummeting in popularity, something like 8% of under 50s now vote. And traditionally, and some of those photographs are unfair, the Conservative Party has had sort of retirees and members, they may fall asleep in warm weather. Do you, do you sense a change in the makeup of the people going to conference in the last five years? No, and actually, it, it wasn't me that commented this. So if it, if, if it offends anyone, someone did comment, where is the Blue Rinse Brigade at this, uh, at, uh, at this conference? Because it was a very young mm. membership and it was, and everywhere you look, there was youth. So I actually think the makeup of the party is still attracting young volunteers. And actually, in this current climate, I think more activists are being pushed towards a Conservative Party where they have right-leaning politics and the media narrative often says that's entirely wrong people are being slightly more pushed to get more active than they may have been before. So I think as a party, perhaps not um, in the wider voting base, but as a party, we're certainly seeing an uptick of youth engagement and younger people wanting to get involved. And, and you're a London Assembly member yes. where, you know, the polls aren't great for the Conservatives here. Would it be fair to say, I mean, we've sort of looked at this sometimes on Byline Times mm. and had debates among ourselves, the party has shifted to the right. I mean, we'll see what Dominic Greaves has said. But there is a sense that, the, you know, it's attracting more of the sort of UKIP vote. And, and statements like Sweller Braverman made, obviously there's a fringe event where she said her dream, mm -hmm. like a Martin Luther King dream, to see um, migrants, refugees, we don't know until they're assessed, but a lot of them turn out to be genuine refugees, who even if they enter illegally, to see them on a flight to Rwanda. Is this red meat so cultural is this side of attracting the younger voters, because the economic story is not so great at the moment. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's important to step, obviously we are a broad church, and in that dominion, um, mine and Suella's probably is not the same, so I, I, w I wouldn't endorse those, those comments. But I think that actually draws the point about having a distinctive London message. Uh, and showing perhaps those younger voters within London that we are relevant and we are um, the party that kind of uh, reflects their views, perhaps more socially liberal but fiscally conservative, and that's a very important space to be in. Um, that's interesting that that space still exists because from the outside you might think that the socially liberal bit had been squeezed out by the red yeah. meat sort of issues. Right. And from talking to colleagues that are more in the, the famous uh, blue or red rule, whatever you want to refer to it the, any, anymore, um, they, they have that more uh, socially conservative, conservative voter they're trying to appeal to. So, of course, it is slightly different right now, but that's why it is, as I said, important to have a distinctive London message. And actually, for London Conservatives, we had um, 
more of a buoyant conference because in the past week there'd been it had been a terrible week for Sadiq Khan. He'd been summoned um, over the Tom Windsor report. He had his consultation over the extended, extended ULEZ come out, showing 66% of Londoners were against him. So actually, there was a big backdrop in London that, you know, we're thinking, well, here's a space for us to enter. But a very important part of entering that is that we have to get the socially liberal bit of uh, conservative politics right for Londoners, otherwise we won't regain their trust. Elliot, one of the interesting things that our political editor picked up on at the, at the conference, uh, from who he was speaking to, was... Some people associated with or who work for some of the think tanks that we've talked a lot about as having some influence on this trust's administration, they were actually saying, God, we've worked for years to get our ideas and our sort of policy thinking out there. And she could bring us down because of the consequences of what's happened with regards to the mini budget. I mean, what, what do you make of um, the Tufton Street and... Uh, and, and how that's all panning out. I, I think some of the, the sort of dark forces narrative is, is rather overdone and uh, th there is this, I mean, it, it's, it's a nice sort of media picture of, you know, lurking interests hiding behind veils and, and manipulating ministers. I mean, the, there is certainly a, a, a sort of tranche of what you would call, I suppose, right wing, but certainly free market, mm. uh, relatively libertarian views uh, represented by a, a number of think tanks. And certainly those have some traction with the government at the moment. But I think one of the reasons that Liz Truss may have won the leadership in the summer, uh, because it was a very difficult election for anyone to win in some senses, was that she at least seemed to offer a new ideological platform. I mean, Rishi Sunak was stuck between two horses really because he was trying to represent novelty and, and a departure from the past but of course until July he'd been Boris's Chancellor and had, had seen her through Covid-19. So I think um, Liz Truss and the people who were likely to form her inner cabinet like Kwasi Kwarteng, like uh, Suella Braverman, seem the sort of people to have at least some kind of coherent direction of travel even if it is relatively far off from what we've had in, in the past. So uh, I mean, if, if they, two of them, Kwasi Kwarteng, Liz Truss and Dominic Raab, no longer in the cabinet, co-authored a book called yep. Britannia Unchained, which is very much that sort of free market, almost zero government. But these are market fundamentalists and the market has fundamentally rejected them. Is this not a problem for, you know, what if you're a libertarian bent, you don't, can't, Margaret Thatcher famously said you can't buck the market. And the markets have quite clearly bucked their spending plans. And actually, not just the tax cuts. You know, they don't like the benefit cut, proposed benefit cuts either. Is there not? Though it's new, one reason it wasn't tried before, this kind of extreme libertarian, well, it's libertarian, didn't work with the markets. I think uh, the problem that the, that the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have had in recent weeks is that what was presented was quite a, an ambitious kind of small state attempt to to reform the government, but that there was no real solid sense of where the money to fund that was going to come from. And I think that was the issue that made the markets very nervous, um, that it was rushed to them on the last Friday that the House was sitting before it, it, it adjourned for the, the, the state mourning for, for the late Queen. Um, and so I think it wasn't so much that the market said, we don't like this sort of free market approach. It's, I think what the market said was, this doesn't add up. This doesn't work. The markets, in a sense, and one of the great things about the market is it's not ideological. It's purely what uh, works. practical. Yeah. It, it, but surely what works is the, 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 the sort of trickle, the Laffer curve, the idea that you could keep on cutting taxes to the rich would grow the economy. All the evidence is from the IMF and uh, World Bank and things like that, that, you know, there comes a limit to that because people just save that money. You need to spend more money for the less, you give more money back to the less well off. Oh, clearly there does come a point at which, uh, you, you know, you, you don't increase the tax take by cutting taxes. And, and uh, there's a huge debate about where that comes. But I think what's interesting is that given that the government's now said that it's abandoning the, the cut to the 45p tax rate, it's now saying that actually that wasn't going to raise very much money at all anyway. Mm. Um, so one wonders exactly how critical to the whole trust project, if you want to call it that, the, the cut in the top rate of tax was. But certainly, you know, historically we've seen that back in the, the days of the, the winter of discontent, extraordinarily high tax rates are a perverse incentive. We yeah. do lose money on that. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a yeah, debate like to be 80%. had. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a debate to be had about at what point you can reach a, a level below which it's not efficient. But certainly, we've got to remember, we are taking more tax than we have done since the Second World War. We, we're in an extraordinary 
economic and political situation. And that I don't think that long term is sustainable, however the, the trust's quarting approach has worked so far. Well, Emma said she thought that uh, Liz Truss did a good job in a very difficult circumstance with her first conference speech as Prime Minister and leader of the party. You can make up your own mind now because we're going to look at some of the clips highlight of Liz Truss's speech on Wednesday. And after that, we'll be joined by the former Attorney General and Conservative MP Dominic Grieve to discuss wider issues of where the Conservative Party is going now. I'm not going to tell you what to do or what to think or how to live your life. I'm not interested in how many two-for-one offers you buy at the supermarket or how you spend your spare time or in virtue signalling. I'm not interested in just talking about things and the Conservative Party will always be the party of low taxes. I stand here today as the first Prime Minister of our country to have gone to a comprehensive school. <laughs> Conference, it's wrong to invest only in the places that are thriving, as economic models often have it. We need to fund the furthest behind first. And for too long, the political debate has been dominated by the argument about how we distribute a limited economic pie. Instead, we need to grow the pie so that everyone gets a bigger slice. I am clear we cannot pave the way to sustainable economic growth without fiscal responsibility. So we will bring down debt as a proportion of our national income. And that's why I promised on entering Downing Street to act. And now we're joined by Dominic Grieve. Thank you for coming in, Dominic. It's a pleasure. We've talked before about Brexit and the impact that had on the Conservative Party and causing some pretty big divisions. What we're seeing now is reports of a very different party emerging uh, in terms of the Conservatives, not just in terms of the policies that are being put forward, but also perhaps the membership and some of, some of what they desire to be put into action. What do you think? Is this now a completely different party from the one that you joined? It's certainly very different from the one I joined. I, I suspect that hiding in the nooks and crannies, there are still very many traditional Conservatives. If I look at my old association in Beaconsfield, I don't know if some of them may have resigned, but some of them are still there passively because they've got nowhere else to go. But there's no doubt that it has changed in a very dramatic fashion. On the whole, the Conservative Party was about the delivery of quiet government. It was about, we will manage the economy, we will address problems, and we will do it in a sort of quiet way. We're not a revolutionary party. Uh, now the language is actually revolutionary. Uh, and the difference is that in 2016, it was revolutionary boosterism, as represented by Johnson. Everything's going to be absolutely wonderful. Uh, Johnson, the era has come to an end disastrously, leaving, 
leaving a poisonous legacy. And what we now have is a group of politicians who are desperate to prove that Brexit was the right thing to do and that the United Kingdom can expand economically because I think the ghost that is haunting all of them mm. is the realisation that now Covid's gone, Italy there's the Ukraine, but if you do any comparative study of the way the UK is performing compared to its main continental partners, France, growth rate for next year, very low, mind you, 1%, but ours predicted at 05 And that is very, very frightening for them mm. because actually the whole justification of everything that they have been pushing, which is that there are these sunlit uplands just waiting mm. to be had, like Michael Gove when he was being questioned earlier, they can't bring themselves to admit that they might have made a colossal error. And so they're being radicalised because it seems to be the only way out. And I have no doubt that the reason why Liz Truss did this extraordinary mm. commencement to her premiership is because she wanted this announcement that somehow she's miraculously going to create a growth rate of 2.5%, which is very dramatically high for the UK. Normally, in good years, we've knocked around 2%. Oh, and she has paid no regard to what I would call the basic ABC of economics. Mm. And so it fell flat on its face. And not only that, even people who are broadly supportive of Brexit are now questioning her leadership. Mm, mm. So we're getting this increasing fragmentation. Uh, now, where the traditional Conservatives are in all that, I don't know. Uh, the comment I was listening to, how young a conference it now is, that the Blue Rinse ladies are not there anymore, I would be a bit worried about that. Mm. Because actually, the Blue Rinse ladies are the bottom of this party, you know, the thing that holds it up. And it's all very well attracting, I don't know, maybe several thousand young people who are full of revolutionary ardour and zeal, but that's not going to win you a general election. It's interesting that you think that she's been led to this point because she has no other option, this growth, growth, growth mantra. To what extent do you think her personal ideologies and convictions around the free market fundamentalist sort of thinking is, is playing out as well. And it, it, does that represent an ideological shift or is it purely a pragmatic shift? Uh, no, I think it is an ideological shift. I, 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 you only have to look at the election when she became leader to see that the, there were ideological issues in the sense Rishi Sunak was marketing a much more traditional form of conservatism. Le, le, forget about Brexit for a moment because it's history. It can't be undone. Mm. But he was saying prudent management. She took what she claimed was a sort of Thatcherite ideology, but I have to say has absolutely nothing to do with Mrs Thatcher at all. She would be looking aghast at all this and decided that Reaganomics was the solution to the UK's problems. And the problem with Reaganomics is in the United States, it probably does a lot of damage in the long term, but you can do it in the short term, which is to borrow to reduce tax. In the context of the UK, which is a trading nation, large but not super powerful, it's impossible to do that if you lose the credit worthiness of the markets. Mm. You will be trashed. Mm. Um, and her willingness to go down that road I don't know who may have warned her about what she was doing. I simply don't know. But the, the willingness to do it is an ideological conviction. And in fairness to her, the people who elected her in the membership of the Conservative Party were looking for radical solutions to their anxiety that Johnson had, A, disgraced the party by his personal behaviour, but that, secondly, the benefits of Brexit were not being delivered. So she's under pressure to deliver those benefits and to show that now that COVID's over, they're there. And she was trying a shortcut to do it. Dominic, um, so we have, you know, not allegations, proof. You say Reaganomics, there's this influence of often funded through money, dark money from the US, of these think tanks, which preach a kind of zero uh, government. But when it came to the market, as I pointed out to Emma and Elliot, the market fundamentalists have sort of ignored market fundamentals, as you put. So... The word Brexit, you say that's over and done with, right? Now, the way we got through the fall of the pound in historically was the pound fell down, which made our exports cheaper. 
But our exports, you, are, are, they have barely grown at all. Where if you look at exports post-COVID of other European countries, they're up 10, 20 percent, and we're floating around. It. So surely, though Brexit's over, some Conservative leader is going to look at, if you're going for growth, a customs union, a single market. Yes. And how long can Canute like any Conservative leader ignore that reality? Uh, I agree. That is the reality. Uh, and a Conservative leader at some point in the future is going to have to face up to the fact that if you want to maximise the UK's economic potential, you have to be in something as close to a single market with your European partners, because that is, in fact, what gave us 20 years of sustained growth. It's very, very simple. Um, will they be willing to do it or any of this lot? I have to say I rather doubt it. I think it's much more likely that the Conservative Party will be trashed at the next election that Keir Starmer will form an administration and you will find that whilst he's always said, I am not reopening Brexit, mm. he is the person who is in the better position to start sending delegations to Brussels and saying, can we increase our relationship? And bear in mind that in 2025, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement is due for review anyway. So you could get that convergence um, and that... So we might go back into phytosanitary alignment. We might start talking about whether we can have some limited kind of free movement. I don't know. Or we might even go back into absolute free movement. My view is it's going to happen. But to ask a political party that has anchored itself to the idea that you are, we are a free, sovereign nation that is never going to go into those arrangements again... I don't see it would, Liz Trust doing it. And even if she were to go in three months' time, it would be an immensely courageous Conservative leader who would be able to persuade the Parliamentary Party to accept something which so many of them have turned their face against. Well, just following that thought, I mean, and what the what good news is in some ways, I don't know if you agree, and I know that Jonathan, this is joining us later, we've had this discussion. The good news is she focuses on economics and not on culture wars, right? So that, at least, we're having a proper debate about growth, and, rather. And she's quite different from Johnson. Before, before I, I, I give the impression of totally disregarding her, she seems to me to be a person of perfectly honourable. Uh, she's had to make a lot of compromises in one said things during the course of her election campaign, which I think she probably doesn't really necessarily believe. Um, but she's shown her pragmatism. She went to Prague. She's had the meeting. She's finally started to integrate into what is, in fact, the EU's political network again, which comes at, I have to say, without any particular strings attached. And the way she's handling the Northern Ireland right. Protocol exactly. and my old friend Steve Baker's comments on that yes, very all suggest to me that a certain amount of realism is creeping in. And it jolly well needs to. But um, that said... How can a Conservative leader, short of an electoral disaster and having to remake the party from the bottom, completely abandon six years of policy, even though those policies may be completely crazy? So, so just, just thinking, looking ahead, you said in six months' time she might not be there. Is it possible, still possible, that we could change leader twice before an election? I think it's unlikely. Uh, the only way it could possibly happen is if really the lack of confidence in the opinion polls are so bad uh, that it's clear that her brand is never going to take off and is just sinking and still sinking, in which case I suppose there would be a parliamentary putsch, there would never be an election involving the membership and they would simply find somebody and say, please rescue us, bring us together, we're desperate, we're all about to lose our seats. Uh, and it has happened before, well, it hasn't happened before in replacing the leader, but it is right to say that in 1997, the party went into a complete meltdown. And I've always thought, unfortunately, that this is where this whole saga is going to end up. And I must say, uh, the smell seems to me to be identical. And I have to ask, Dominic, finally, is there room for a new political party? In is the it, UK, is it a real, people like yourself who it's, have it's a role a really to play in public life? Difficult question. Yes, there are a large group of people who are essentially excluded from public life. We are moderate conservatives. We've either left the party or been chucked out. 
Uh, we stand just to the right of the centre ground of British politics. We see ourselves as being traditional conservatives. Um, but where do we turn? Mm. Uh, it's a crowded field. Uh, the Liberals are flatlining, really, at the moment. I know they can win by-elections, but there's no evidence of a revival. And they do seem to me to be very inward-looking at the moment. Mm. The fact that when Nick Clegg came over, they were saying, oh, don't worry, we won't have anything much to do with him. Well, for all Nick's faults, he was a large political figure mm. and he took the Liberal Democrats into government with us. It was a good coalition. I know it did them damage, but it showed them to be a responsible party. And that just doesn't seem to be around. So they're not viable. Starmer, if he's got any sense, will do his best to occupy the centre ground. He's not there yet. Uh, that's the only thing, and it worries me. I can easily see it lurching back into directions which will be very unacceptable to me, and I think it will make mistakes and won't serve the country's interest. But how do you get a centre-right grouping off the ground? Um, and I, I'm not optimistic that that can happen at the moment. Although, um, I have to say, I've got to the point where I, well, I'm genuinely willing to consider it because somebody's got to come and rescue our country. Because at the moment, it is doing very badly and it's unnecessary and it's the result largely of incredibly stupid decisions. And is there not a possibility, as I remember the 90s, of crossing the floor? I mean, I'm not saying yourself, but there were several quite high-profile instances. That's what the sign is, Blairism. We've had one Red Wall MP cross the floor from the Conservatives to the Labour Party. And there might be more. And in the run-up to 2019, some of my Conservative colleagues ended up in the, the Liberal Democrats and, and are still there. And I, I see I'll keep in touch with them and we, we remain on extremely friendly terms and I, I wish them well. Um, and there may be more going to Labour. That, I think, will be the more interesting trend. But... Despite all that, that doesn't create, coming back to your question, mm. it doesn't create a new centre ground party. That would require a great leap of imagination. I suspect it would require the Liberal Democrats to do a great leap of imagination. Mm. Uh, and at the moment, I don't quite see it because it would, it would require a shift in their thinking about where they are because they've always identified themselves as a left of centre party. Mm. Uh, always claim that they're sort of much closer to Labour, even when sometimes you think that's not the case. It's mm. one of the big ironies of British politics. The third party has always located itself close to a party whose members don't really like them. Well, Whereas, ironically, uh, centre-ground Conservatives have always found them actually quite easy to understand, but they've always said, oh, no, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, because you, you adhere to a set of values which is, uh, which is not ours. It, and it only broke with the coalition in 2010. Mm. And interestingly, although I do regret it did them no good, I actually am proud to have been a member of that coalition government. I think the Liberal Democrats moderated us. I actually think Cameron used that moderation to steer the party in a better direction and to deliver what certainly for the first three to four years I think was actually pretty good government. Of course they made mistakes, all governments make mistakes, but it was infinitely better than what we've got now. Thank you, Dominic. And on that note, one of the things which the coalition government did in 2011 and 12 was after the phone hacking scandal, institute the Leveson inquiry, of which we're still waiting for part two. And that's partly due to Nick Clegg's intervention and it was an all-party agreement to have this inquiry and follow through with a better regulation of the press. That did not happen. Meanwhile, if you've been paying attention to the news, you may have seen an exclusive story from our sister site, Byline Investigates, about one of the newspapers, a right-wing newspaper, which has since escaped allegations of phone hacking. Well, not anymore. At least three claimants, very senior people and well-known people, Baroness Doreen Lawrence and Elton John and Prince Harry, have lodged claims against Associated Papers, the Mail, for deeper and darker privacy intrusions rather than just phone hacking. These include burglaries and tapping of landlines. Of course, the Daily Mail deny all these allegations. But here's Byline Investigates Chair and Byline Times journalist, 
Brian Cathcart to discuss what's going on here. And after that, we'll be joined by Otto English and Jonathan Liss to discuss the state of the press and the coming Lord Dacre. The cases announced today uh, involving the Daily Mail represent a milestone in the history of journalism in Britain. Um, it is the biggest thing to have happened since the Leveson Inquiry. Um, we have learned lots since the Leveson Inquiry, but uh, the fact that six people of this standing, Prince Harry and Doreen Lawrence, um, Elton John, are prepared to take on the mail, which is ferociously litigious, on this issue of whether they were spied on, that's what it comes down to, uh, by male journalists, is a remarkable event. Even, you know, let's see how it pans out. The fact that they're ready to challenge is, is, is uh, extraordinary. And the, that we have come to this after all the Daily Mail's denials, and it has denied and denied and denied since, really since phone hacking broke in the, in the you know, a dozen years ago, it has denied everything along the way. Now it is basically in the dock and going to have to defend itself. And uh, I think, you know, what plays out now will be absolutely fascinating and very important for the character of journalism in this country. The Daily Mail is the most powerful newspaper in the UK. It is because of the Daily Mail, because of the Daily Mail, that we have Liz Truss as Prime Minister. They, more than anybody, engineered her elevation. <laughs> they are now in the dock for spying on quite significant, important people. Um, uh, you know, Elton John may be a pop star, but he is a, a national treasure, an important figure, global figure. Prince Harry, we all know, um, you know, it's, that's, that's royalty, but it's also, um, you know, one of the most prominent people um, on, the, on the planet. So you can hear it. it's raucous <laughs> here because we have two troublemakers <laughs> joining us. To my left, laughing rather loudly, is the endlessly hilarious Otto English. Thank you for joining us, Thanks, Andrew, sorry, Otto, really? and Jonathan Liss, another of our great columnists. And they're sort of dying to talk about the mail. No, they... <laughs> I was asking... <laughs> so they are... They can't talk about anything and they don't need any <laughs> rehearsals. But I think one way to start this uh, uh, conversation, maybe let's get into this way. Uh, Jonathan, we spoke soon after Liz Truss was, um, well, about to be elected. And you said, well, she's honest, you know. It's going to be better than Johnson. So that's what you said then. I'm holding you to this. You said at that point... Well, at least she sort of tells it. Do you want to leave now, Jonathan? <laughs> so, this, okay, so, so, Peter, you just asked me a moment ago yeah. uh, where my article is. And the answer to where my article is, so I was writing an article and then I had to change it halfway through because <laughs> my, my, the whole thesis of my article was that for all of her faults mm. and for all of the complete ideolog ideological disagreements you can have with Liz Truss, there is something disarming about her style in the sense that, like with Thatcher, mm. she says what she believes. And she, and she actually implements it and she tells the truth. And what I was really struck by in the first week of her premiership um, was in the House of Commons, in the Prime, in Prime Minister's questions, she took on questions directly. Mm. There was none of the bluster yeah. of the Boris Johnson years. She was extremely courteous, which is, you know, it's not everything in politics, but it's something. And she responded to questions directly. Uh, and I thought, this is really interesting because we've moved away now mm -hmm. from the personality-driven politics of the Johnson years. And we can actually have a debate about policy, which is really, really welcome and refreshing. The but. problem with that is is that everything's now been turned on its head because yeah. now she's actually the continuity Johnson candidate in the sense that she has no honesty, she lies no popularity about... and no future, but she... no honesty in particular. And how do you think the media has responded to her? Because we know that Rishi Sunak was supported by the Times newspaper, whereas the Daily Mail is very you know, squarely behind this trust. She doesn't have the same coalition yeah. that Johnson yeah. had or well, enjoyed, really. She's got, the mail the, impunity. she's got the mail in the Express. Do you think... How, how do you think the media is reacting to her? Well, let's put it this way. No-one likes to back a turkey. 
and no one likes to continue back in Turkey. And that's why you have, I think the sun is very much kind of waiting on the sidelines to see which way to go. They don't want to kind of call for her uh, dispatch yet, but I certainly think that they're not going all in with the trust show. I think with the mail and the express, you know, they're in too deep yeah. to kind of get out of it now. So it's tedious to withdraw. They've, been, <laughs> they've, been, they've tied better. themselves to the mast, yeah. you know, come what may. Mm. And, you know, the thing, with, the thing with the mail, the express obviously a joke newspaper, so we don't talk about too much about the express, but the mail is so shameless that it can simply move on to the next thing. So if she were to be dispatched, they'd simply tie their, you know, tie their, you know, tie their, tie themselves to the next Conservative Prime Minister. They say, of course, we have a mandate. Them, this person has a mandate to take us to 2024. And of course, whatever the whatever has been going on, it's the chaos of Keir Starmer is far worse. And what I find interesting is that I think people will start to laugh yeah. at that remark because mm. whatever you say about Keir Starmer, he is manifestly not terrifying. And <laughs> that is something really, really important. And so when they were talking the other day, the mail, about the chaos of us, I think they actually said the chaos of the Keir Starmer premiership. I thought, no one is buying that. <laughs> no one is buying that. And it like, just makes you look stupid. Why can't he take this guy on on his policy? Say, we don't like him because he's going to tax us more and we don't like that for our own interests. Why? Or at least say, we don't like it because we're right wing and he's not right wing. But, but, they, but they have to go with this terif terrifying line and that's going to backfire on them because it doesn't seem credible. Um, Otto, I'll bring you in. Because I am struck talking to people just uh, as I do, ordinary members of the street, cab drivers, you know, beef eaters, you know, guards of the outside Buckingham Palace. This trust is roundly hated. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, the levels of disdain. Um, and I remember Thatcher, and I was always struck by, you know, what support she gave them there towards the end, you know, working class conservative voters. Why? Given all that John has said, Jonathan said about she is a bit more honest. I mean, she has lied about anyone going to comprehensive school and about the tax, you know, the how much energy relief we're going to get. But apart from those two big lies, why isn't she causing a bounce? Why is a honeymoon bounce a, you know, a dead cat? Not even a dead cat bounce. It's a dead cat falling off a building. It's the worst polls I've seen. It's even worse than major. You know, I think you, if you are the Prime Minister, you need some sort of political X factor. And we've had, she's come hot on the heels of Johnson, but also hot on the heels of the whole Brexit civil war stuff, which is now pretty much, I mean, it's not over, but, but, but that fight is over. That, that consumed so much of the space of politics over the last few years, it's kind of gone. The pandemic, Yes, the pandemic. Yes, coronavirus is still there. Yes, the pandemic is still going on. But that has kind of gone. What are we left with? All, all of the bluster and the fight has gone. So you've got this person in charge who was a Lib Dem, who then became a Tory, who was a Remainer, I mean, who's then become a Brexiter. I mean, as I said in that spoof piece I wrote in her in her um, it was her uh, acceptance speech. Acceptance right? speech. I, you know, the old line. Great line. These are my opinions, and I will stick to them as long as uh, I unless can, you want, or... uh, until uh, I find out you don't like them, and then I'll do something else. <laughs> and I think I think I nailed that. I think, uh, but Johnson was the Trump. same. Johnson had two columns in the yes, Telegraph. Yes, but we expected it of Johnson. You see, the thing is, Johnson's just said he, that he thought that she was a different type of leader. But you, you've got the same thing, but without any of the personality and the bluster. It's the same stuff going on. So it's the same rhetoric, not performed quite so well. Is it just yeah. that? Is them? Yeah. I was going to say. I mean, do you think? Keir Starmer, for example, as a political X factor. Because, I mean, the, the big poll, poll ratings, the 33% lead that Labour's enjoying, and it's sort of, it's being sustained, shows that it could well be that there's an, a Labour government. But how's he, going, but how's he going to interact with the Murdoch press, with the Daily Mail? Does he have that X factor to persuade them in a way to, to come or round? Does he do or does he need it? Does yeah. it? I think this is the point, isn't it? 
He what? needed it uh, back in Blair's days. Blair, the Blair thought he needed it. Well, in the end, he didn't. We don't know. Mm. We don't know what would have happened if the sun hadn't gone. Obviously, the sun, no one thinks it's more important than the sun. No, no one thinks the sun is more important than the sun does. So we just don't know. It has, has the media become less important, less powerful since then? Oh. In many ways, it has, but it, it's still you know, incredibly important in the sense that it dominates the agenda. It sets the, mm. the news agenda for this country. We still talk about what's in the headlines, uh, even though very few people are reading it. But it, it sort of punches above its weight, mm. so to speak. So, of course, you still want to, but does Starmer need it? Kind of, you know, if you... What do you think, Otto? Star does... The thing with Starmer is he seems convincing, right? He might not be the most exciting politician, but he definitely seems to be on top of... He seems to be on top of things. He seems to know what he's talking about. If you look, if you look at what they're planning, if you look at his ideas of Lord's reform, and there's, these are sol the stuff that Gordon Brown is coming up with. Mm -hmm. These are fairly solid ideas. He's got some kind of agenda. The Conservative Party is like a sort of circus with, with a plate spinning act, yeah, yeah. becoming ever more manic spinning the plates to try and stop them falling down. Well, they're, they're, they're exhausted. They, they're exhausted. They, out, they don't, yeah, they yeah, don't they know what they're for. Yeah. They don't know what they're for. The yeah, Conservative yeah. Party no longer knows what it's for. The, the, the broad church of the Conservative Party, which included people like Dominic Grieve, have been pushed out and shoved out. You've got a sort of little Brexity rump cult around the country with a leader who doesn't even believe in Brexit. I mean, so I, I, disagree, look, I actually disagree with this. With this point, I mean, I, I, I can, I'm, I'm happy to accept the fact that Liz Truss is not a Brexiter in her heart, but I'm also happy to accept that she is mm. actually, and that people who are very, very zealous can, in fact, change their minds mm. and become completely embedded in their new ideology. And actually, I think the one thing you can say about Liz Truss, which you couldn't say about Boris Johnson, is that she really does believe a lot of the stuff that she's saying, because if she didn't believe in cutting taxes to the richest, then she wouldn't, in her right, in her wildest imagination, or in her wildest dreams, have done it, because it was obviously such a politically toxic thing to do, which mm. anyone with political antenna could have told her. But she wants to do that because she really believes the stuff. And I think you can, in fact, trace an ideological seam mm. or a continuum between mm. her lived um, from her lived down years to her current years, which is that she believes powerfully in the individual. Uh, and that's and that's a, a perfectly legitimate okay. point of view. And it's also a, a, a very well-established uh, sphere in the Lib Dems about sort of... The, the Orange Book. About the Orange Book liberalism, about personal freedom and that kind of thing. So I don't think it's in wildly inconsistent, mm. actually. Mm. And in fact, that might make her more dangerous than Johnson, because whereas Johnson was focused on what was going to get him to the next point in his career, Liz Truss really does believe all this stuff. So isn't that, she, therefore, she's deluding herself, you could say, to a certain extent, that she believes herself so much she will sack the permanent secretary to the Treasury, she will ignore the markets. So it this still doesn't quite explain to me her lack of popularity. Why that, and we, we've got family members, somebody who just find that it, maybe it's the last pass of conservatism, conservatism that, that she's so unappealing. Is it now looking like... Starmer's played a blinder by not reopening Brexit. So the last gasp was, make Brexit happen, we're a Brexit party. And Starmer doesn't fight them on that ground. That means that, you know, all she's left with is libertarian ground and they can't relitigate Brexit. And in fact, they sort of have no nowhere to go as an ideology. Yeah, they've got the culture you, you just said much more articulately what I was trying to say three or four minutes ago. They've got nowhere to go mm. apart from this... Tax and uh, you know tax stuff. Well, that's already that's already been shown to be completely yeah. unpopular. That's why obviously you know the you know the, they've tanked in the polls because you know, people can see the economy crash and they can see their mortgage rates going mm. up and they you know the energy uh, the energy price cap um, hasn't been hasn't sort of actually got them much credit. And if and if it were to get them credit, Labour could simply go in hard on the windfall tax issue. Yeah. The fact that we're going to be paying yeah, for the energy price um, cap guarantee, whereas it should be the energy companies that are paying for it. So I think Labour has so many cards at its disposal. And, you know, you know, there's always something else. You know, if they run out of things to talk about, there's the bankers' bonuses, which has been completely eclipsed mm. and by the other stuff. And, of course, um, we've got the benefits issue, which is going to be very, very big in the next couple of weeks. And we've also got spending cuts, a return to austerity. Mm. So, you know, Labour, obviously, there's no, it's not a good place for the country to be in. But if you're the Labour Party, you have an embarrassment of riches mm. um, to be focusing on. And you don't need to do a deal with the Sun necessarily because it's mm. got half the number of voters. But... And we don't not forget also, I think Connor Burns has been uh, suspended from the party for allegations at the conference. There's always the personal scandals of the Conservative Party. But I want to put that question to you, 
that we put to our viewers, Peter, about Lord Dacre. Ah. What do you think that would represent if the former editor of the Daily Mail, I believe he's still got a position at the Daily Mail... Is, is chief editor, yeah. ...is elevated to the second chamber, the legislative chamber of this country? Well, he can join illustrious other baronesses and barons, Baron Siberia, another newspaper proprietor... Uh, Labradev. ...the Baron... Uh, but isn't that interesting that... that Claire that, Fox let me say, of the Isn't Revis it interesting that there Revis are now Revis two... Newspaper proprietors whose potential, we, don't, we haven't confirmed it with Dacre yet, but there could be two newspaper proprietors or publishers or influential editors who sit in the House of Lords. There used to be Isn't three. that extraordinary? And in also, the, Dacre's. In, in mail, this day and age, I Over think. the last three or four years, has come up with at least three front pages condemning the unelected House of Lords and saying it should be abolished. Uh, I mean, Dacre does have. But not all editors, he's not the editor anymore, but not all editors have huge control over their newspapers in the way that Dacre... The, the mail has been Dacre's paper mm. from, from its front page to its sports page. You know, the, the, this, the hypocrisy mm. level. It's the same with Claire Fox. You know, Claire Fox went around for years condemning institutions and the establishment and railing against the unelected elites in Brussels. And the first sniff of ermine, and she's in, you know, she's on the red be the benches. You know, you've got the same thing with Dacre. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that Boris Johnson's uh, resignation honours list is going to be, you know, catnip to so, us. So, so my thought of this, just to close, and we are, we're coming back after the break, but I'll tell you about that in a moment is this is the best argument for constitutional reform. We haven't got the... These aren't the resignation on us, by the way. This is just the yeah. standard. Dacre's in the standard realm of, you know, they, each party gets to nominate uh, peers. And we've got the resignation on us. In a way, Truss, economically, Johnson, in terms of standards in parliamentary life, over weaning sort of closeness to the media, they've helped us out, haven't they? Because they've exposed the corruption around this country is always prone to. And one thing is that, you know, if there's a catastrophic landslide against the Conservatives, that means legislation's going to pass through. We could talk about proportional representation, constitutional reform, all these voter suppression measures, like taking a photo ID, won't matter. And they can all be reversed. Do you not think this, in a way, is a, a turnaround, if we can survive the next two years? Oh, actually, I'm going to ask you, do you think we have to wait two years, or will that happen quicker? Well, for an election... Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, if, if the Tories don't have to call an election, I don't see why they would. And they are, they're completely shameless. If there was another Prime Minister, they'd say, well, the constitutional law says we don't have to call an election until 2024, so why should we? So we'll just go with this person. He might be a little bit more popular. Who knows? Maybe that Prime Minister will be compelled and say, you know, the public won't stand for an endless you know, roll call of Tory prime ministers without an election. So we'll have to have one. But, you know, that election would be a disaster for them, I'm sure. Mm. In terms of constitutional reform, I, I don't hold your breath, is what I'd say. This is a short answer. I wasn't my mouth. Otto, you had a thought on this. Well, I read a very compelling piece comparing the moment now to 1976, where the, 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 a struggling Labour government puts Jim Callaghan in, You've got a lot of the same stuff going on. You've got an energy crisis. You've got, uh, in fact, they had rising unemployment, didn't they? But you, you've got massive uh, inflation. inflation. You've got all those things going on. And um, and how really 76 to 79 was the sort of turning point for the destruction of Labour as Callaghan clung on and waited for his moment. And how you then had a Thatcherite agenda for, for 18, well, 13 years. And then you had the major agenda for five or six or whatever it was after that uh, and, and what, I, what I was reading this afternoon made a very compelling argument that this could be almost Labour's Thatcherite moment where they sort of transform the country but in a good way <laughs> in a good way uh, and where you've got the Conservatives essentially kicked into the long grass for, uh, for a decade I mean nobody can predict what comes round the corner next but I think that's, I think there's a good case for that. I think the, the Conservative Party have so damn the name. And what you were saying about Liz Truss, I, I don't think I have met a single person. In fact, even dedicated Brexters who follow me and comment in my Twitter feed have turned, mm. this is an, purely anecdotal, but 
you know, Boris fanatics and pro-conservatives and Brexit people have all said to me, Liz Truss is rubbish and needs to go. That's confirmed by the polls. If you see, she's got a min minus 59% approval rating and something like 15% of Conservative voters, not, not um, I don't know, so switch to, to, to Labour after this. Well, we could continue talking about this all night. And we might do, mightn't we, Hardy? We will. So we will, the four of us and Elliot Wilson, will be back for our After Dark Q&A, which will start in about five minutes. So if you're not yet a member, you can still head over to byline.tv forward slash join. You can put your questions to our guests. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. We'll be back next week, 7pm, Friday night with Byline Times. Have a good week. Thank you.